Thank you, and welcome to my speech. I first would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, as you can see from the title, we are now going to do a complete switch from uh, entrepreneurship all the way to what does this take to be successful when I apply in industry. And I thought I'd start off with telling you a tiny little bit about myself. I have a PhD in plant biology, which is pretty different than what the rest of the audience has, I guess. And after my two postdocs I did in Switzerland, I did one at the university and one at the ETH, University of Zurich and ETH, um, I decided to leave academia. And it was really difficult for me to get a foot on the ground in the private market. And um, this is one of the pieces I'm going to tell you about, how did I manage and what kind of traps did I find on my way. Lucky at one day, um, I did a complete change, and this was a strange moment to throw away all your lab journals. They went all into the trash can because I knew there's no way back. And from being a scientist, I moved to become a headhunter. And the guy who hired me, he said, I would like to have somebody in the market who knows what PhDs are capable of doing, and sorry for the terminology, and what they don't know how to transport their ideas and their skills to the market. And so he hired me, and it was pretty risky on his as well as on my side, because if I would not have performed, he would not have regretted to fire me within the first year. Lucky, <laughs> I managed to do this job rather well. And after I've been a headhunter for a couple of years, I then was lucky that one of my clients came and asked, are you ready to move to us? And so from the small entrepreneurship, I moved into the reinsurance business, and first I was in an IT project, and later I became a head of the shared service department. And since almost 15 years, I'm self-employed, and I have two kinds of clients, university and industry clients, and if there are some questions about this, I'm very happy to help you out with answers later. Um, what it is that I see in my office and in courses I do for universities, I see very, very well-educated people who come to see me and say, Monica, you know what? I don't get it. I have the feeling I have a 100% match with these open positions out there, and for whatever reasons, I don't get, I don't get invited for interviews. And then I started to think, I said, what, are, what kind of problems are the people facing? And I kind of figured out that we have to look to two things, two problems with different pairs of glasses. And today, we only look to one of these problems. And the first problem is, what kind of story is my CV telling so that other people can understand what it is that I'm capable and willing to do? And I would like you to start to think about it. I will, I will give you some little questions during the talk. Huh? I would like you to start to think about the question, how often, if you want to move to industry, do you think you have to apply to get invited for one interview? Whatever your number is, if the number does not hold through, you have to go and check your CV. The other part, and I already said I'm not going to talk about this, is if I'm invited for interviews, the first one, and I never get invited for the second one, there's a lot of problems with personal presentation on the oral side. And I already had pe people with these problems in coaching. Just for you to, as a little starting point. So great educated people, wonderful CVs, and some of them say I have a hard time in getting my foot on the ground in industry. And I thought we start off with asking some of the basic questions. And the idea is that applications is much more than just, so to say, to think about how do I do the self-presentation, but how do I have to link important elements. And as a brain teaser, I thought we start with some of the fundamental questions. And the first one is, how large is my academic slash or industry labor market? And of course, here we do have an issue with the country we are in. But when you think about the Swiss labor market, how many companies are out there who care for the skills you have? This is the first question. The other one is, how many other people will apply for the same positions? We have to start to think about our competitors. And if I give courses, for example, 
at the university and I do the courses on how to apply to industry with biologists, they would say, in Zurich today, there are 1,000 PhDs in biology educated, and I think the number has even increased. While in math, we only have 200 or 150 PhD students, and this is already telling us a lot about numbers of competitors, and at the end of the day for this talk, it's going to tell us about precision in my thinking process as well as in my self-presentation. So, what are my personal sales arguments? And some of the earlier speakers already used the terminal of the me too, and I like you to think me too would mean I'm a biologist and you are a biologist, and do we all know the same? And is the same good enough for the labor market? Or what do I have to present so that people think, hey, this is a cherry on the cherry cake, and how can I make this visible? And then, of course, we have the question on how do I do convincing self-presentation? I will drill down on this part. And another question is, what will my decision, what kind of effect will the decision I do today have on my long-term future? And we've heard this from Novartis before. They said, oh, it's really good to do a, a postdoc because Novartis is, and, and Roche is probably not hiring people without a postdoc. But a lot of other, for a lot of other people, we could also think about is this really a good thing to hang out in academia, and sorry for the language, to turn older before we try to start to move into a different direction. As a closing from this slide, I would like to share with you, every professor by statistics is educating 100 PhD people in a lifetime. And in the old days, 3% of them would have a chance to become a professor themselves. Over the last 10 years, Switzerland has almost doubled the numbers of PhD students. And I know we have masters and postdocs here as well, but this is the best number I have. So today, one out of 100 has a chance to become a professor, which puts a lot of pressure on the decision making, I think. And uh, on behalf of this, I thought we do a little, I take my position here. When I think about uh, applications, what is the first thing I like to do? I like to us to think about what kind of different opportunities do we have. And I would be very happy if you could raise your hand briefly so that I can get a clue on the audience. And my question would be, who of you is looking for an, a continuous of a career in academia? Ah, look around, see the competitor, sorry. <laughs> Who of you is thinking about what is aligned under the general track? This is what in the literature would call the third space jobs. These are jobs in the university environment, but they have nothing to do with doing research, but rather with coordination administration positions. Who's looking for this market? Great, okay. And then I have what I call the industry. Uh, which is in indicated here with the, tab, uh, with the pills. Who is looking for an industry job? Okay. And then finally, McKinsey. I never know how to say this. I call McKinsey, I call industry, industry. It has nothing to do with the things we learned, but they look for all of the transferable skills we have developed. Who is looking for this market? Wow, okay, super. So we have representative of all of the four fields. And what it is that I would like to ask you from this slide is the question, what impact does this decision have on my CV, the competences I have to show, and the way I do the job research? Where, what kind of sources can I look at, and where can I find the positions? These are four completely different markets we are tackling, and all of them have their particularities. And um, as a start, I'm going to show you a slide I developed with a little model to make sure that when we think about application strategies that we have all of the relevant elements. And all the time you will see one piece in red, and this is the piece I'm going to talk about next. And in the center you can find the statement on the job content. What it is, what, is, what kind of job is this that I'm looking for? And when we go back to the slide before, you probably have already seen 
that academic and the expert position, these are jobs that require our expertise. What is the knowledge I have got or developed in, in, in doing my science? While the one in the third space and at, at McKinsey, I call this, these are jobs that require generalist or more transferable skill aspects. Um, again, but I would not like to discuss this, I'm inviting you to think about at this time how many different job titles do I know where I would like to apply to? Hmm? Okay, then we have the four other elements. I briefly touch ground on and then I go into the depth. Huh? Question on the target market. On the target market is always the question on what is my view into the labor market? How many companies exist to care for my skills? And where are they located? How do I slice them? Am I a person who is more keen on working in service industry, production, doing research? What is the idea I have? Huh? And I will say something on the labor market in a second. Again, a little question for you to think about. How many different companies in this area do I know? And sorry, I don't want to insult somebody. No, beside Roche and Novartis. <laughs> and I will come back to this and the um, entrepreneurs who already spoke. Then we have the part with the benefits for the employer. This is something even very well, uh, or not very well, but people who have been in the business are struggling quite a, long, uh, uh, quite a lot with. What it is that I bring to the employer that they think I'm the cherry on the cherry cake. Very often I have people who think, I'm getting things. But this is a turnaround in the question. It's like, what it is that I'm giving? Why should people, what kind of skills are inter uh, companies looking for, and why should somebody be interested in hiring me? Then we have the application ways, and here is also interesting for me to raise your attention to the question on, am I in a reactive or in an active modus? And I've known a lot of people who prefer, for whatever reason, the reactive modus. And reactive, I call when I have an alert, for example, on Job Scout or Job 24 or Monster or Indeed or some of these things, where I get information into my inbox and I then react on behalf of what I've seen. This is the moment when all of the competitors get exactly the same job advertisement in the inbox which then means that you have just a much higher number of people you have to compete with in the market. On the side of the active uh, application ways, I think about networking, which we heard already. I think about finding particular companies you are interested in, for example, thinking about spontaneous applications and where is this possible. And finally, we have the documents. And about the documents and its needs, I'm going to talk a little bit later. What is the worst thing I've seen in my office? Sorry to say. Um, I've seen people who say, job content for me, everything is the same. I do not really know what I want. And the labor market, it does not matter whether it's a startup or if it's a big global player. I just have one big idea about them. Benefits is not what I get, but what I, what I give, but what I get. And my application ways is I use the most common sources. And overall, my self um, presentation in the documents is not bringing across the key message when it comes to applications to industry, and this is, I can do this job. And now I'm going to drill down uh, into the job content slide. And here I stole one from Hayes. You can see, maybe if you get the slides later, you can see the link to Hayes. And Hayes did something very nicely for people who are in the pro pro progress of uh, applying. What you can see is an organization. And the dark blue part is research, and then you have, uh, what is this? Uh, uh, medical and safety, then you have production and quality, and marketing and sales. So the most uh, left side, these are the so-called business areas. What you find, as in the little letters, which is probably impossible for you to read, these are the job titles. 
And in between, you find these boxes, always three for a number, which is then giving you a job family. And a job family is something really interesting because a job family is a cluster of jobs where similar skills are required to fulfill the tasks, which means that if I want to apply in a dark blue box, for example, in biostatistics, and if I want to apply in marketing and sales, I have to have at least two different CVs because if I'm applying on an expert job, I have to bring across my expertise, all the hard skills from doing science. But when I apply in marketing and sales, sometimes I say a little bit sloppy, I mainly have to transport that I can talk. So this is like two complete different worlds. Huh? And it's really important for you that you start to think about differentiating. How many of these boxes am I willing and I can uh, uh, I can take a job in. And in my expertise, I would say most of the time people have two to maximum three different job families they care for, which indicates that they have to have two or three different CVs. Uh, I wrote down something else for you just so that I don't forget it in case you don't know this. This homepage intro desk, this is a really good point for all of you who say, I would like to know more about companies. So companies do their little self-presentations and it helps you to get a clue on what it is that they are producing. Okay, now, because we have postdocs and PhD students and master's students, I thought I'd do one little other step asking about the level we are, have raised in academia from the student to the uh, uh, PhD to the PI to the professor, and then ask the question on how much in age can I advance to apply to what kind of positions. And um, I've met a lot of people who try to do an academic career for a very long period of time, around uh, until the age of 40, and then they said, and now I would like to change to industry. And it turns out that this is rather difficult because if I'm then on the level of the PI, that would mean that I need to apply maybe for an expert position but most of the time people then had already first leadership experience and it's always a question on if industry is interesting hiring somebody into middle management who hasn't had a formal training yet. So I put down the slide to raise awareness on the question on how long can I afford to stay in academia age-wise before I really have to consider that I have to change. This is on the side of the job profiles, and as a last statement to this, if I'm applying for, an expert, uh, for a management position, of course, the first key point in my CV needs to be that I have first management expertise, that I have led other people. Next slide I would like to share with you, and now you can see that the target group is um, colored in red, is the question on the Swiss, in this case, labor market. I take Switzerland as an example, but I would like to say that most countries have a pretty similar distributions on companies. And Switzerland has 330,000 companies. So on the first side, this looks like a lot of things to choose from. But when we look to the statistics, we have, can see following distribution. From the 330,000 companies we have, Round about 1% of them are the big global players. Roche, Novartis, Credit Suisse, UBS, Siemens, uh, you name it. Huh? What is happening in the market is that they have the tendency to draw all of the attention. When I do the question in my courses on how many companies come to your mind for the PhD or postdocs who want to change, they are always, most of the time, stuck with the big global players. And when we now look, look to the big global players, and we have seen this already on the slide of a person who talked before me, we have a couple of advantages, but also disadvantages. When Novartis puts out an open position for a biologist, half the world is applying there. <laughs> I don't know how many applications they get. So we have high level of, uh, of competition, and they require a really high level of expertise. 
So they can drill down on that you really know this one little molecule they are looking for and blah, 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 which then brings us to the problem later from this level of expertise, how can I go somewhere else? But this is another story. In my perception, the big size companies, they really like certificates. You cannot just go there and say, I can do project management. The next question is, do you have a certificate for some of these things? If not, and you have a high number of competitors, I'm pretty sure that some of your competitors will have a certificate. And finally, the online tools. I cannot say this for the pharmaceutical industry. I know this better from the banking world. The online tools is something nobody is ever looking to your CV. Just forget about it. It's a batch process that's run overnight where the computer is trying to make matches. Can we get enough matches with the keywords? And this is when I meant to talk about the big banks and other industries. Half of the time, all of these things are not done in Switzerland anymore. Deloitte, for example, is thinking about recruiting, doing all of the recruitment processes besides the interviews, of course, in Romania, and the big banks have their recruitment in Poland, and so just forget about it that anybody's looking to your CV. What I'm trying to bring across is, if we have as an applicant a focus on the big size companies, we definitely have to use other ways to get to get my finger into this wallet. We have to use networking. If we try to do it the regular way, the chances of getting success there is really low. Now we come to some of my favorite com uh, companies, and these are the 6%, they call it mid-size. And I decided that I make it to mid-size companies. These are companies between 500 to 1,000 employees. Because a mid-sized company, it has, it has to have a similar structure as we would find with the big-sized companies. So they have to have specialized groups or teams working in marketing, working in research, but they are not, they don't have so many people on, the uh, uh, on job sharing, meaning that they cannot afford to have one expert per question, indicating that in these environments, when you think about your self-presentation, you can show a broader profile of yourself. So your CV can also have more transferable skill. It might can have completely other things where you can say, I can also swing in particular knowledge in statistics or whatever it is. So, and I would like to say that the mid-sized companies, looking from the strate uh, strategic point of applying that the mid-sized companies, these are good targets to doing spontaneous applications. Statistics would say that 10 to 15 percent of the people in a company change during a year. With a company of 1,000 people, so there will be 100 to 150 job openings during this year. And HR in these companies, they have a pretty good clue on what is what kind of vacancies they are going to have, and when they see your CV, you can count on that they will look at it, and that you have a chance even with a spontaneous application. And this, as I said already, it's very similar for all of the countries. 93% of, of the Swiss countries are small size uh, companies, and the startups definitely belong in these groups. And you can see, if it's a company with three people, the chances that they hire a fourth one is, I don't know, we have to look to how the situation is and, and uh, what kind of extra um, uh, skills they need. So when we think about that our target market are the small size companies, we again need to consider, I will not be hired as, an, um, as a specialist, meaning, that I can have a CV more on the side of a generalist or showing more skills than even for the mid-sized companies. They will rarely use search machines, so you, it's more going via the network. And of course, this is a very different career path because most of the time you have one boss and until this person retires, there's no way that any of us is uh, um, stepping up. Huh? This on the side of the labor market. Do yourself a favor, ask two questions. How many companies, for example, in the one or six percent size do I know, and where do I see myself getting involved? Now we come to the benefits 
for the employer. That thing is a very strange thing. And I had people sitting in my office and say, I don't like that question. I say, that's too bad for you because it comes anyway. Um, benefits for the employers. I can translate the question into another language and say, why should somebody pay you? What it is that you bring so that somebody would say, this is the amount of money I'm picking up and I give you for the salary. And nobody is paying us today when we say we can do the same thing as all of my competitors. So we really need to figure out what it is that is my speciality. Where am I better than others? And for the scientists, as well as for the people in IT, I also like you to think about why should somebody pay me in 2019? If a company is hiring a scientist, they want to know from you what is the edge of science? Where do you see the market moving to? Where do you see yourself making a contribution? And um, yeah, where do you see yourself making a contribution? On behalf of this, I thought I'd swing in one other slide on this thing, and this has to do with competences. And um, briefly, competences are generally divided in four different categories. So we have the technical expertise, which is your field knowledge, knowledge in the trends, all the methods you know, all the statistics you know, all of these things. And we have the methodological skills. And just for two examples, I wrote down um, uh, research management, data analysis, statistics, of course, can also be a methodological skill. But the important part here is the upper part. These are the so-called hard skills. And people want to see in your CV your hard skills. They really want to see where can I bring a solution, where can I have a, uh, where can I bring a solution? The lower part, these are the so-called uh, soft skills, social competences, and personal skills. And I know that I'm now drawing a very big picture by just separating these two things. But I, would, I think that the um, soft skills are more an issue in the job interview. And tomorrow, you are going to have an, um, a nice talk about job interviews. What I've seen a lot is that people try to convince others with personal skills, for example, in the cover letter. And the worst thing is I'm stress resistant, and I'm a team player. And what else do people write, team player? Oh, 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 oh. And I'm an analytical thinker. Jesus Christ, help me. Who would raise their hand when I say I'm an analytical thinker? I, oh, not so many. OK, ah. I call this is a wonderful Me Too message. Huh? Most of the time, everybody says, I'm an analytical thinker. And I like you to think about maybe I'm thinking logical, structured, process oriented, chaotic, mathematical. I can do so many different ways of thinking. And people have the tendency in the application documents to stick to these me too terms, as I call it, and then also to use the things everybody else is using. And this is going to be a disadvantage. Sorry for this bad message. I'm here to talk about the CV. And finally, at slide 11, I get to this point. It's unbelievable. Huh? Um, the documents. Huh? Um, what is there to think about the documents? I already said that we now can link three things. Huh? The job content, what kind of job am I doing? Am I in academia where I need a resume, which is a complete list of all the achievements? Am I going to a startup? Am I going to a mid-sized com company? So the link between the job content and the company size and the benefits. And now I would like to show you the big differences between academic and non-academic applications. And I start with academia. Academic applications on the level of the uh, professor are already very much advanced in a career. These things are dozens of pages long. Whenever I have to look to CVs and I have these postdocs with 500 uh, papers and all of these things, I get 25 pages of CV. And then they say, I would like to apply to industry. Whew, I see this is, this is exaggerating for industry. Huh? 
In academia, the content, all relevant accomplishments, publications, presentations as, as a key currency we have, and then we have the research project and teaching and awards and affiliation, everything. Key message in an academic application for me is I am an independent scientist and I can do all of the tasks that will be required once I'm a postdoc or a PI. Industry is different. Industry, in reg unless I'm going for an expert job in R&D, then the CV might be longer than two pages because it would make sense to have all of my papers and presentations to, to join into these applications. The message is the ability to do this job. So when I think about myself, I see myself having three different CVs. I can go to the market as a coach and trainer. I can go to the market as somebody who has the ability to lead a small company or I can go to the market as a process manager. And when you think about this, you already see that these are three completely different sets of skills that are required. Big change is, it is um, in industry, the CV is organized by a logical structure. Academia is organizing the CV by content. So I have education, where did I work, what did I teach, do, 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 do. And we have the same data set at multiple times. And industry then interprets this as that we have multiple lives. Industry is organizing the CV by one period. The time I did my PhD from June 28 to, to whatever, July 2015, or however long this thing is, everything I did has to go into this chapter. So they have maximum the same data set twice, no more. Huh? Then, so this is a logical organization. Then in, in industry, I would really strongly encourage you to turn around things from academia. In academia, in most of the cases, we have used the education first. In industry, we have the working experience first. And sometimes, as a joke, I say to my students, you don't want to appear in the labor market as a person who is age 30 or 32, whose self-picture is, I'm educated. We have to transport the PhD time as working experience. And this is where they like the company function tasks. Now I would like to say one word about the tasks. All the difference in the CVs is only coming according to the tasks. What it is that I did while I was uh, doing my PhD. And when I'm going to do a job in R&D, I'm emphasizing my research skills. When I go for marketing, I'm emphasizing my communication skills. So it is like a little bit uh, targeting of the CV. What else I see is that people often forget about the IT skills. And this is where I say briefly, the more the merrier. Hence on working experience. Huh? Um, the audience is too big, but what I always like to ask is, what do we learn at McDonald's? And then the students look at me and say, what does she want from me now, huh? McDonald's? Huh? I've been there, I've not worked there. Huh? And then I say, let's, let's think about McDonald's. And McDonald's, I've learned probably teamwork, which would be a social competence. I've learned to work under pressure. I learned to follow rules. I learned to talk to customers. I learned how Swiss hygiene regulations are, which would be a hard skill. So working at McDonald's has the power to transport a lot of extra skills you have. And this is when people say, after the PhD, I'm interested in changing to industry. I think, go to your past and see whether you have hands-on working experience where you can transport, I've worked for salary, which is a strange thing to say. Again, difference between academia and private industry. Industry is nosy, they want to know about our personality, and there I'd like us to think we have two spots for personality. One is the hobbies, and there is nothing as boring as what some of the Swiss do. When I ask about the hobbies, it's skiing, hiking, and cinema. And then I say, who? That's not a good thing to put on your hobbies. 
can you make them a little bit more specific so that your personality is shown? Huh? And some of us have extracurricular activities, which is always something to impress. And this might be a USP. Message at the end of the day is, I can do this job while in academia we have the resume which shows that I'm an independent scientist. When we think about the structure, and I already said this, in my world, the CV is a story that covers the past because it shows what we did. It needs to be easy to be understand. Literature would say HR looks to the CV for 30 to 60, 60 seconds, meaning it has to have an attractive appearance. Huh? It presents, unless I'm going to the small size companies, a profile. It shows the tasks that are demanded in the job advertisement I can do, and it shares working experience if I have it. And make sure that you do not have only Me Too messages. If all your friends raise their hand at the same moment, you know, oh, 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 I need to do something to make it more specific. The cover letter in my world is future driven. And uh, there's a little funny structure that is helping you to design that thing. There is a you part, which has to do with that you have to tell the company you love the company. Why do you want to work for them? Sometimes I say it is close to dating. Sorry, I don't want to insult anybody, but I'm not so sure if UBS cares so much for the you part, huh? because it's a huge company like the others, and do we really care for why somebody wants to work for me? But the mid-sized company and the small-sized company, they definitely look to these things. What I see with the iPod is that people use, lose self-marketing space by repeating the CV in prosa. And then I did a bachelor, and then I did a master's, and then I did a PhD. And I like us to think about the requirements I've seen in the job advertisement. I fulfill the tasks I've done. Both things you can see in the CV. And now, these are the benefits I bring to the company. This is a piece belonging to the fu uh, future. And the V structure mainly goes on behalf of uh, when we meet for the job interview. So um, now we have these two things. And I thought I'd show you one slide on the industrial cover letter, one page. Sorry, I sound very strange, same font as the CV. So I'm, when I do a um, CV review, I always look to the thing that these things are concise. Huh? Um, it is signed. The you part, I found the job on your homepage. If you say I found the job on Job Scout, I am immediately interpreting you haven't even been to my homepage. The I love you part and active language People, I don't know why we do this. I would like to apply. I'm applying. This is what I'm doing. So we have to pay a little bit attention to the decoration words, if I may say so. The iPod, I already said. What I would like to say on the side of self-sabotage for the cover letters is make sure that your cover letter is not full with, I hope I'm the right one. I guess I can do the job. I'm a match and that is an interesting company. Make sure that we have compliments. And I, what I also see quite often is I would like to learn something. And I say, if I want to learn something, I go to Abendschule or to Mikro Club Schule. And when I look for a challenge, I go bungee jumping. And when I write a cover letter, I know what I can offer. Mm -hmm. Finally, almost finally, uh, the CV. Hmm? And you can see the CV two pages. I think I spoke about most of it already. Um, always carefully think awards is always a good thing. Is a patent, is this a good thing to write down? Can I impress somebody with this? Papers, presentation, extra courses, skill inventory, what it is. That makes my CV that my CV is a good representation of myself. Um, second last slide, I said something about the application ways, and I would like to close with pitfalls I see with applicants, and this is 
When people think about applying, there's often this rumor around about the hidden labor market, and the hidden labor market by rumor is big. Sometimes you find numbers that go all the way up to 80%. And the hidden labor market we can tackle with networking connections and for having people in companies who help you. The covered labor market is a huge issue, and I like to say on the covered labor, covered labor market, how many companies do I know? Am I in the trap of only knowing the big size ones? Unawareness on the job possibilities I have, so that I do not know, about, know enough about uh, job profiles. And finally, I'm invisible because my CV is not really transporting what I wanted. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.